Welcome to the Barbara Lee and Ella U. Harris Lecture Series. This is an opportunity for us to have a conversation about important topics. Today, we want to talk about reparations, an issue that affects not only the Black community, but our entire country. We're honored to have the opportunity to hear from some very important uh, public officials on this issue. Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, and Assemblywoman Shirley Weber. These women are all working on policy issues that affect this important topic. The fact that we've just come through an election of historic proportions, I think is going to add to the importance of this subject. The Assembly, the Senate, the House of Representatives all need to be looking at the issue of equity and equality. We've seen historic kinds of things happening, not only the election of the first uh, woman of color to the vice presidency, but also to dealing with the issues of racial justice and economic equality. 400 years ago, we had the first enslaved Africans arrive in Jamestown. No one could really understand this country would be built on the backs and the minds of those slaves and their descendants. We saw wars fought. We've seen victories achieved because of the contributions of those individuals. But I don't think we fully understood the impact of slavery, racism, and economic oppression on those same descendants. If we really understand what's going on in this country, going back to slavery, the Dred Scott decision, the Civil War, and the commitment of General Sherman to get 40 acres and a mule to the 40,000 men and women of Northern uh, Georgia and Southern South Carolina, and then have that promise evaporated when Andrew Johnson relinquished that land back to Confederate landowners who'd owned it prior to the war. That promise has never been kept. And we've seen the ramifications of that failure to enact reparation on generation after generation of the descendants of those African slaves. We now have an opportunity to begin to bring about healing, social justice, and really work to make sure that everyone in this country has the opportunity to achieve the American dream of justice and equality. We see profit, usurpation, and privilege be the defining characteristic of this country's attitude, policies, and treatments of those African Americans. We must make a change. How we do it, who should get the benefit, is something we should discuss. How we achieve racial equity, how we achieve social justice. We all need to participate in discussion. We need to be open to everyone's ideas. We certainly need to hear about how that conversation should take place, not in uh, ways that in fact are just discriminatory, but also ways to talk about healing, to talk about justice, to talk about affirmative action. We saw the failure Proposition 16 in California, the opportunity to restore affirmative action in the state go down in defeat. Why? I don't know. Was well, because people didn't understand, didn't appreciate, or didn't agree? I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know the conversation has to continue. We're going to do that today. The Barbara Lee and L.G. Harris Lecture Series is brought to you by the Martin Luther King Freedom Center. Freedom Center was created 25 years ago to engage young people in social change, to create a leadership, a cadre of young people who are committed to civic engagement, civility, and more importantly, to community development and empowerment. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Roy Wilson and Dr. Karen Bolke for their leadership in working with our young people. We want to make this a model, not only for our community, but for the entire country. The young people can make the change, be the leadership, be the voice for the voiceless, but more importantly, to show how we can work together to make change in our community and in our country. We're going to have an incredible conversation. We're going to lead off with one of the real voices from academia on the subject of reparations and social justice. Dr. Rashad Ray, who is a member of the Brookings Institute as a fellow, but also a professor at the University of Maryland in College Park. He is someone who blogs, someone who speaks out, 
to a, a, a social media audience on the issue of social justice. We want him to give us the background, to give us an understanding of the issue of reparations before we get into our more vibrant discussion. So it is my pleasure to introduce to all of you a real dynamic voice on the issue of reparations and social justice, Dr. Rashawn Ray. Hi, I'm Dr. Rashawn Ray. I'm a David Rubenstein Fellow at the Brookings Institution and also a professor of sociology at the University of Maryland in College Park. I want to thank the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Dr. Roy Wilson, Karen, Ethan, and others for making this event happen. What I want to talk about as I open is why is truth, reconciliation, and restitution central to ending systemic racism and moving our country forward? Many Americans recognize the troubling ways that the historical remnants of systemic racism and its current vestiges are destroying our nation and preventing the United States from actualizing its true democratic ideals. The next step in America's racial awakening process is to continue realizing that to truly end systemic racism, it means to engage truth, reconciliation, and a restitution process to atone for the legacy of slavery and its current manifestations. Following the murder of George Floyd, nearly 80% of Americans reported that racial discrimination is a big problem. In June, Congresswoman Barbara Lee proposed a bill to establish a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. In a sense, Barbara Lee's bill is a much needed complement for H.R. 40, the long-standing sought-after reparations bill first proposed by Congressman John Conyers in 1989. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee has taken up the mantle to continue advancing H.R. 40, a bill to form a commission to study and develop reparations proposals for the descendants of Black Americans. A congressional hearing on reparations occurred on Juneteenth in 2019. Combined, both bills notably underscore that, that systemic racism cannot be solved without political will. The Congresswomen are paving the way forward. On a state level, California, led by Assembly Member Dr. Shirley Weber, is paving the way as it recently passed the bill AB 3121 to establish a commission to study how reparations will be allocated in the state. Universities, including Georgetown and Princeton, have enacted reparations to provide tuition for descendants of enslaved Blacks who were sold to establish the university's large endowments. While Princeton Theological Seminary will pay, Georgetown students voted to pay a semester fee of $27.20 to symbolically represent the 272 slaves sold. Scholars, policy analysts, and politicians have established models for what reparations could look like. For truth and reconciliation, countries, including South Africa and Canada, have provided a blueprint for this process. For financial compensation, economists Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen provide a comprehensive case for direct payments. Their economic analysis estimates at least $10 trillion to provide restitution for the sentence of Black slaves. In addition to cash payments, my Brookings Institution colleague Andre Perry and I propose a reparations package that includes tuition remission student loan forgiveness, down payment and housing restoration grants, and small business grants. These are wealth building strategies to tackle social institutions that are most persistent at creating and maintaining racial disparities. Despite this progress, reparations are a topic that is difficult for Americans to wrap their heads around. A quick history lesson is important. First, reparations are to make amends and repair a wrong by providing restitution to the descendants in this case, of enslaved Black Americans. Reparations were provided to American Indians for executions and forced removal off of their homelands, mostly in the southeast of the United States. Reparations were provided to Japanese Americans for World War II internment. Internationally, Jews were provided reparations for the Holocaust, for which the United States continues to play a pivotal role in facilitating this process. In fact, spouses of descended Holocaust victims are still able to receive reparations payments. Importantly, these reparations were not allocated immediately following the acts. Rather, restitution was often provided years after these gross state-sanctioned injustices. For example, reparations for American Indians were not provided until 1946 and 1971, and for Japanese Americans until 1988. Simply put, Black Americans are the only group to be systematically discriminated against by the government to not receive reparations. In 1860, 
over $3 billion was the value assigned to the physical bodies of enslaved Black Americans to be used as free labor and production. This, this was before the products that they actually developed. Immediately following the Civil War, General William Sherman and others decided that Black families should receive 40 acres in a mule. The legislation became known as Field Order 15. However, President Andrew Johnson, who assumed the presidency after President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, reversed the legislation and returned the land back to previous slave owners. Adding insult to injury, some slave owners actually received reparations for the value of the bodies of their former slaves. For those who say that slavery was too long ago, you should look up some things. What about Tulsa, the Tulsa, Oklahoma massacre that killed 300 people and demolished 35 block, which what was known as Black Wall Street? What about the 1917 East St. Louis, Illinois massacre in which ended up destroying 300 businesses? What about the 1923 Rosewood, Florida massacre that killed 150 people? And then what about the Homestead Act that was supposed to allocate land to black Americans, but ended up mostly creating wealth for many white families? Nearly 10 percent of all land in the United States. Contemporary social science, medical science and the rapidly expanding use of artificial intelligence and social media reveal the cost and potential threats to our democracy. If we continue to allow unhealed, entrenched divisions to be ignored and exploited. For those wanting to tell their children they were on the right side of history and did the right thing, now is the time to truly show what it means to be an advocate for racial equity. Thank you. I just want to take time to introduce our panelists and speakers for the day. First, we have Congresswoman Barbara Lee who serves as the U.S. Representative for California's 13th Congressional District. Now in her 12th congressional term, Lee has served since 1988 and is a member of the Democratic Party. The district uh, numbered as the nice district from the uh, late 1990s through 2013, based in Oakland, where I happen to live, where both of my boys happen to be born. Congresswoman Lee is the former chair of the Congressional Black Caucus and also the current whip and former co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. She is the vice chair and founding member of the LGBTQ Equity Caucus. Congresswoman Lee, thank you for giving us the opportunity to have this conversation. I also wanna introduce Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, um, who currently serves in the U.S. Representatives for Texas 18th Congressional District, which includes Houston, uh, and currently serving in her 13th term in the House and has served there since 1995. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee is known as the voice of reason, uh, was vital for the Violence Against Women's Act, and has also served as a ranking member of the Homeland Security Subcommittee, among several other things, including leading H.R. 40 and this historic legislation. I finally want to introduce Dr. Shirley Nash Weber, who is currently serving as an assemblywoman in California. She represents the 79th Assembly District, which includes parts of San Diego, as well as other areas. And importantly, as a member of the, of the California Legislative Black Caucus, she is the first African-American to be elected to the California State Legislature south of Los Angeles. And prior to being elected to the assembly in 2012, Dr. Weber served on the San Diego Board of Education and also as a professor of African-American studies at San Diego State University. Of course, as a scholar and academic, I love seeing academics become politicians. So thank you all for this opportunity and I look forward to this vibrant conversation. I wanna turn it over to Congresswoman Barbara Lee for her opening remarks. Well, uh, first, uh, let me just thank you, Dr. Ray, for uh, moderating this panel, but also for your uh, really keen insight into this issue as it relates to uh, our history, the history of African-Americans, the history of the Middle Passage, uh, and why uh, we must uh, repair the damage. And so thanks so much for being with us today. It's really an honor to, to have you uh, moderate this. Also, let me just say to um, our colleagues, my colleague, Congresswoman Jackson Lee from my home state of Texas, I wanna thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, our young people with the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center uh, were excited that you would be part of this lecture series. It's been going on for 
oh god eight to ten years now and we've had some phenomenal speakers and lecturers and this is so timely uh with with your work on hr 40 uh and uh we just really appreciate and honor you for being here today and to of course dr weber let me just say um, how proud i am of california proud i am of your leadership because never did i think that california would be the first state to pass a bill establishing a commission to study and develop uh, reparations. And I say that because I go way back uh, as a staffer, uh, when Congressman Conyers um, also introduced HR 40, it, this was in the day. And I remember going to the California Democratic Party and passing a resolution. This was probably in the early 90s then and uh, got the California Democratic Party on record supporting HR 40. Never in my wildest imagination would California uh, lead the way and never in my wildest imaginations would would I think that uh, California was a state that wanted to really address the issue of repairing the damage and reparations. But you, you saw it and you, your vision and your insight and your determination really uh, put us on the right side of history. And so I just want to thank you. Uh, I have a couple of experiences I just want to share. Uh, yeah, growing up here, you know, I moved from Texas to California um, when I was 13 years old. And um, we, uh, I, I, I attended San Fernando Junior High, San Fernando High School, and I wanted to be a cheerleader. But only the selection committee would select cheerleaders, and they would only select cheerleaders who were blind and blue eyed. And uh, I was about 14 then. And so I went to the NAACP, the Pacoima Lutheran um, Credit Union, because I was working on work study and went to my boss, John Mance and Carl McRaven, the late, great John Mance and uh, Carl McRaven, and talked to them. And they said, we'll help you, uh, because I came out of an NAACP family in Texas. And so do you know they helped me organize the school, San Fernando High students, and made them change the rules of the game so that the full student body could elect cheerleaders. And so because of that, by then I was 15, I tried out in front of the student body at San Fernando High and, and I won. I was the first black cheerleader at San Fernando High School. But that's an example of systemic racism. They didn't even think of it like that. But we had to crack that barrier so that myself and other girls, other black girls could then become cheerleaders. When I was a, a much younger, uh, when my dad wanted to buy a house, he was in the military in San Leandro, California. Uh, and we think California always had fair housing. Well, this was <laughs> in the day, of course, uh, he was a military man and wanted to buy a home, told my mother he knew he could buy one if he put his uniform on and went into uh, San Leandro to buy a house. They ran him out of town. Uh, crosses were burned in San Leandro. We'd have to drive around. Black people would have to drive around San Leandro. Uh, but some progress. Guess what? I represent San Leandro, California now in, in the Congress. But it took so much work. Uh, and, and the disparities and the racism is so systemic in California until a lot of, of people don't even realize how deep it is and how broad it is. And so, Dr. Weber, you're bringing all these issues to the forefront so that everyone can understand the, the damage of the past uh, to African-Americans here in, in the Golden State. And so thank you so much. I'll conclude by just saying uh, I have introduced HR 100, which calls for a Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Commission. And this is very consistent and works in in, in tandem with uh, HR 40, because you know we have to have this truth-telling moment in order to move forward. Because a lot of the public, they do not understand uh, what it means when you see black people being uh, disproportionately incarcerated, for example, or what it means in terms of health disparities. African Americans dying disproportionately from from uh, health disparities from COVID, or why um, the damage of of the past is is still manifested in the deaths of, of African Americans such as with mr. Floyd and Breonna Taylor and so connecting 401 years ago 
to systemic racism and how it's manifested is an important endeavor for public support so that the public can be educated about why we need to have this transformed state and country and make sure that racial equity and justice and repairing the damage is part of that transformative process. And so we're working together, uh, Congresswoman Jackson Lee and myself on these bills uh, in Congress and hopefully uh, now with uh, a new uh, great president and vice president in the White House, we'll see some progress in the uh, House of Representatives, which will be able to cite California now as leading the way once again, uh, as it relates to uh, reparations. So just thank you all so much for being part of this discussion. I'm really proud and excited, uh, of course, uh, coming after this uh, campaign and the excitement around that, but there's just so much work to do. And we have got to remember in these HR 40 and what uh, the commission here in California will do now under uh, Dr. Weber's leadership is gonna keep the issues of African-Americans before every single uh, house, every single legislature, every single governor's uh, office, and of course the uh, national government. And so we can't let this slide now just because we won. We've got to double our efforts to make sure that justice is finally done in, in our state and in our country. So thank you again. Greetings. What a pleasure to be with the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center and this very important discussion. It's certainly my privilege to acknowledge my colleague, uh, the Honorable Barbara Lee, who is cherished by her colleagues in the United States Congress for her vision, her compassion, and her legislative genius. But we also know what a treasure she is for the people of the state of California. And we acknowledge that she is a great leader for the state of California when we hope that she will continue in that leadership role and as well for the nation. I'm delighted to be here with uh, Dr. Shirley Weber, uh, whose long legislative history uh, in the California Legislative uh, Caucus and Legislative uh, uh, Assembly uh, has been uh, well known across the nation. Certainly her work on establishing a task force, her legislative work on reparations, uh, tracking HR 40 in the most appropriate form uh, indicating that this task force would study the impact of slavery and then the assessment of potential compensation uh, and the determination of eligibility uh, is clearly in line with the spirit of national legislation uh, that is to acknowledge this question of reparations for people who are held in bondage for over 200 years and never once was an apology given or any assessment given on the economic engine, tragic economic engine that slavery happened to be. I'm very delighted to acknowledge again, uh, Dr. Wilson, uh, Dr. Balke, uh, Dr. Ray, uh, as well for their leadership and glad to be with you. Uh, let me uh, acknowledge as well, uh, my predecessor, the late Honorable John Conyers, uh, the former Dean of the United States Congress who introduced uh, this legislation in 1989, almost 50 years ago. And of course, in his passing or before he uh, left Congress, he asked me to take up the leadership. And I've been introducing this legislation for a number of Congresses, each time building on the mountain of support. We now have over 200 civil liberties, civil rights, progressive, um, religious, uh, conservative, moderate and liberal groups and individuals that are supporting HR 40. We have close to 170 members of Congress coming from all different perspectives of the Democratic Caucus. And of course, uh, looking to collaborate with Republicans in a right thinking attitude to also be supportive of this very vital legislation. It speaks for itself. There is no question as to whether or not uh, reparation is an international legal standard. And along with my friend, uh, Congresswoman Lee, who has introduced um, HRES 100, dealing with truth and rec reconciliation, the uh, HR 40 is the tools. It is a toolkit. It is a box of tools. It is the implementing force that will deal with the reality and the desperation and the damaging effect of slavery. Uh, the only population to be held consistently in bondage in the United States uh, were African-Americans 
Africans who came to the United States in 1619. Uh, some numbers show a little bit before as well. So the descendants of enslaved Africans have faced this question of horrible disparities that really cry out for the question of reparations. I take from an article citing Dr. Shirley Weber's uh, enormously important legislation, and she made this quote, the discrimination practices of the past echo into the everyday lives of today's Californians. That could be lifted from that quote and said about Americans. And so the slave echoes of the past are resonating in the lives of the descendants of enslaved Africans in this country right now today. Congratulate uh, the state of California for this bill becoming law. We look to this bill becoming law. And in the coming days and weeks, this legislation will receive the most uh, coveted concept of legislative process. That is an official markup. Never in the history of the United States Congress has there been such a major piece of legislation dealing with this question of bondage uh, in this Congress. And so we look to a markup that will occur, and that will be part of the journey of this legislation to the floor of the House, ultimately to the United States Senate, and ultimately to a signature or an action uh, by uh, the presidency or president of the United States of America. As I was saying, international law uh, promotes uh, this type of response. Uh, and of course, even today, uh, we can look at the disparities. So you can look at uh, white wealth per family of four, 200 and some thousand dollars, I think somewhere between 250 and 265,000, and the wealth of black families average $17,000 for a family of four. The disparities are stark uh, with the 2 million plus persons incarcerated in the nation's jail from federal to local. The predominant numbers of those individuals are African Americans uh, and Latinx, uh, with the predominant number for a number of years of African Americans. The disparities in juvenile justice, uh, where the numbers of children incarcerated in juvenile justice systems, though there have been some advancement and I'm in the midst of reforming the entire juvenile justice system for this nation to give some standards, just as we are attempting uh, to pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act into law, though it's been passed in the United States House of Representatives legislation that I wrote uh, for a number of years and others. Um, we are looking to reform the juvenile justice system, but you'll find a desperate uh, inadequacy or unequalness uh, with respect to black children. So what is reparations uh, and why this meeting is so very important? It is the fact that we deal persistently, consistently, and in a determined fashion to answer the question of the economic engine that slavery was for those who benefited from it, even into 2020 and 2021, uh, and those who suffered from it. So as I conclude, uh, let me uh, suggest to you that the idea, uh, the idea of reparations in HR 40 being unusual, uh, being uh, a leaning left, uh, being untenable is an outrage. I refuse to accept that. I refuse to accept it. We know that uh, when uh, Japanese were interned, it was an outrage. And some years later in 1988, uh, those descendants were given $20,000 through a congressional legislative act. States have addressed the question of Rosewood in Florida. We've addressed the question of the syphilis uh, testing in Tennessee because we understand that lives must be repaired and restored when you have damaged them and you take the essence of their due process, you've taken their property away from them, their life, their ability to pursue happiness, as our Declaration of Independence has said, and as the Constitution says, this nation was formed to create a more perfect union. It did not do that for the enslaved persons and the descendants of enslaved Africans. It did not do that for the enslaved persons uh, because we were not a whole person in the Constitution and remained enslaved until 1863 and then finally in 1865 when it was announced on the shores of Galveston by General Granger. I hope that as our children grow and our children's children, they will look back on this era of those of us, patriots, who stood in the gap and insisted on the cleansing of America and the upholding of those words to create a more perfect union, that we have truth, we have reconciliation, and yes, 
we have a commission to study and develop proposals for reparations, the healing of this nation. And as we've heard, and I might say, uh, to congratulate uh, in my closing, uh, a new transformational government headed by Joe Biden, uh, the working man's candidate, uh, and your esteemed Senator, now Vice President-elect, along with President-elect Biden, Kamala Harris, who comes from a diverse and wonderfully rich background of African-American heritage, African heritage, and Southeast Asian heritage, uh, and brings that power together as an African-American woman and stands ready uh, to look at the healing and unifying of this nation, I believe that this is the time for HR 40, uh, this uh, wonderful repairing, uh, implementing legislation and healing, and of course, to find truth and reconciliation with HRES 100. I look forward to joining you further in this wonderful opportunity of engagement. Thank you so very much. I want to take this opportunity to thank those who have organized this conversation today, particularly thanking um, um, our Congresswoman from California, uh, Barbara Lee, as well as the Congresswoman from Texas, uh, in terms of um, Sheila Jackson Lee. I want to thank them both for being here today to be a part of this conversation and those who have organized it uh, to bring us together to really talk about something very, very important. Um, I'm the Assemblywoman from California from the 79th Assembly District from San Diego. And a part of my um, uh, discussion today, obviously, is AB um, 3121, the Assembly Bill 3121, which is a bill on reparations that was presented this past year uh, that I was author of the bill and, and supported strongly by the California Legislative Black Caucus uh, to basically uh, talk about reparations in California. Uh, last year, we had the good fortune to pass a resolution at the 400th anniversary uh, in California to talk to support uh, HR 40 in, at the Capitol uh, to make sure that we were always on record supporting that bill and making sure that the things that were important and that, that we they recognized in Washington, that even in California, we were very, very concerned and supportive of reparations. Um, this past year, uh, as a result of, of once again, uh, always being concerned and involved with reparations, uh, I've spent the last um, uh, over 40 years as a professor of Africana studies at San Diego State University. And so I'm very familiar with ethnic studies, with all of the challenges that we face and with the ongoing challenge that African-Americans face about their place in this country and the resources that are so essential to develop strong communities. As we've watched other groups come and go and prosper and move forward, uh, it seems as if the African-American po uh, population is, is once again stuck in terms of economic development, educational progress, all those things that are really essential for communities to grow. With that in mind, and having looked at California's history for years, uh, we thought as a Black caucus, there's probably no more opportune time than now to raise the issue of reparations in California, um, because we had uh, been supportive and always supportive of what is happening nationally. But we felt as the, as the fifth largest economy in the world, that California is a huge economy with a tremendous number of challenges uh, that are there, that we needed to at least address the issue of reparations in California, because as most things do, if California has the ability to do certain kinds of things with resources and, and pushing forward, um, many times this, others will follow, uh, we'll, we'll see this. And so this becomes important because uh, we are the largest uh, state and we're one of the largest economies in the world. Uh, and oftentimes people dismiss of the issue of racism or the issue of slavery in, in California and don't actually know the full history of it. So we decided that we would basically put forth a bill in California that would talk about reparations in California for those who are uh, who are active, but also those who are descendants of former slaves. Uh, with that in mind, we presented AB 3121 this past year. Uh, it got out both houses with uh, uh, some bipartisan support um, uh, and we were able to pass the bill and fortunate enough to have a governor sign the bill. So this bill is law in California to form a task force that has to be formed by the middle of next year, a task force of nine members who will not just try to figure out was there any damage done, but to look at the extent in which the damage has been done. So we, we operating from the first premise that there was damage and that how, and this damage, and we want to know exactly how large it was, how pervasive it is, and the areas in which we find this damage done. Uh, and then to begin to recommend ways in which we can, one, educate California about it, but also ways in which this commission can recommend uh, what needs to be done to basically repair the damage that has been done to African-Americans. So we find this to be very important because 
Um, many states and many cities have grappled with small aspects of it, a different city, uh, those kinds of things where there was maybe one incident that occurred. But we looked at the whole the history of California. And despite the fact that California came in as a so-called free state, it had slavery. And it condones slave activities within the states of California. And and we and every day we're getting more information about not only that, but the, the underground railroads, the those who ran away. There was no no sanctuary for them here in California. They were they California adhered to all of the fugitive slave laws and returned people back. Uh, we also had embedded in our state a number of of, of, of covenants and laws that really uh, uh, made it imp- difficult for black people to own land, to start businesses, to get loans and grants, to end an educational system that was segregated. The first segregated uh, um, uh, case that was heard was heard in San Diego uh, uh, years before Brown versus Board of Education. And so California participated in the racism, in slavery, in the degradation of African-Americans and basically the taking away of those benefits and those things that would be helpful. Clearly we had people wondering how in the world could that be California? Uh, why is California involved? Isn't that a Southern thing? Uh, and yet those who have studied the history know and know the reality of it is that it's not. And we believe very strongly that continuing to ignore the impact of slavery on the lives of African-Americans is to once again not acknowledge the work that has to be done. It is not to acknowledge the damage that has been done that continues to hold us back. And without a clear understanding of that, then it be, as, as often it becomes, well, why haven't you people helped yourself? Why haven't you folks done these kinds of things? Without recognizing the fact that there were many, many laws put in place to basically prevent us from owning land, prevent us from, from opening businesses in certain places, uh, statutes that were written to, to deny us uh, access to uh, housing, uh, you name it. A lot of that existed in California and therefore the impact that it had on us are being able to amass wealth. Uh, uh, those kinds of things are still very prevalent. Um, the fact that we, and we recognize the fact that that the whole system itself in terms of, of slavery and, 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 and uh, looking at the damage was done, uh, has seared the hearts of this nation towards African Americans. Because I consistently ask the question, why is it of all the folks who have been in this nation, who have been grieved by this nation, that there was never a desire to create uh, reparations? The 40 acres and a mule concept lasted for a very short period of time uh, in this country and was never implemented. Uh, and uh, as administrations changed right after the Civil War, that that issue just went away. And so but no one has ever felt that there needed to be something done to repair African-Americans for the damage done, for the wages that they gave and the, the work that they put into this country. And to basically, uh, once again, put us on an equal footing to give us a chance to survive. And um, and California was a part of that. And so we have acknowledged that. We believe there's a way in which we need to correct the errors of the past. And reparations in AB 3121 is law now in California. We will we will have a commission. We will have recommendations. We will have uh, programs put in place to begin to repair the damage done to those who live in California and who are, and the system was a part of the whole slave system in some capacity and that it had a devastating effect on African-Americans, not only at that time, but continue to have a devastating effect today. And that's why it's important that we recognize the fact that we have to begin to root it out. We begin to deal with the issues that we face. And California is no better uh, place to start than here. We hope that many other states will do likewise. And we totally support what is happening at the federal level. Uh, we hope to give them also the, the, the wind that California has to begin to move forward in a much more aggressive way, but at the same time uh, to assist us in our efforts as we plan to hopefully assist the federal government in their efforts to be an example of what can happen and to share the kinds of recommendations that come forward that may impact California, but could also be utilized as models for the nation. So I'm honored to be with you today. We're excited about what's happening in California with regards to reparations. Uh, and as we continue to grow and to, to expand and, and, and build the, the commission itself, uh, we hope to share the information we have and to utilize those of you who have already invested so much in in the discussion of reparations in this process as well. So once again, thank you so very much for being here. We look forward to a a robust conversation, but also an exciting year as we begin to implement the provisions of AB 3121. So thank you for that very powerful uh, conversation that you just gave. What I wanna do is now, I wanna go into a discussion. 
And I'm going to start with a very basic but important question. And that question is, why is the issue of reparations, restitution, truth and reconciliation for Black Americans a bipartisan issue? We start with Congresswoman Lee, then we'll go to Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee and then Dr. Weber. You said, why is it, it should be a bipartisan issue? Yes. Yeah, it, it should be bipartisan. Again, that's why we have to build a awareness because everyone in this country needs to understand the uh, impact of, of uh, bringing enslaved Africans to this country and the systemic kinds of, of barriers and, and racism that has been embedded in every institution in this country. And so we have to have a system based on racial justice and equity, not one that has DNA, it has in its DNA uh, racism. And so everyone's got to understand that by repairing the damage, the country will be stronger. We talk about regaining the soul of America. Well, that means Republicans and Democrats. And, and so we've got to uh, make sure they understand that this also affects them and the, their tax dollars and that uh, we have a better way to uh, move forward in, in America and in California because everyone uh, deserves, okay, deserves to be equal under the law and we have not had the equality the system of justice in this country that allows for the the repair of the damage so that we can be equal and so that there is a level playing field republicans have got to come to aware to understand that because it affects them also i love that question dr ray um i i love that question because um, I'm going to build on my friend and colleague, uh, my great leader, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, by jumping feet first. So allow me just to uh, craft uh, for you uh, sort of the core of H.R. 40, the federal legislation, um, and, and its four points. Uh, it has the formal acknowledgement of a historical wrong, the recognition that there is a continuing in injury. And as a lawyer, um, it, you know, this is this falls right in um, line with the academicians who've laid the groundwork, we lawyers argue the case. And so there's a continuing in injury, of which no one can deny. The commitment to redress uh, by the federal government, well, this is what H.R. 40 intends to do, which sanctioned the enslavement and subsequent discrimination. And so to answer the question, Republicans and Democrats, we also have to answer the question of those uh, who have a different opinion as why should I care about reparations. My family didn't have any slaves. Uh, I don't know anything about it. Of course, they're speaking in the current time of the last 10, 20, 50 years. But the question is asked and I'm able to answer it. You may not have had the slaves uh, in your recent knowledge and history, or you might not be able to discern it, but you have benefited. And so these points, the actual compensation uh, the other part of H.O. 40 is the actual compensation in whatever form or forms that are agreed upon. Um, and so that's the holistic picture of reparations, H.R. 40, and that mainline continuing injury uh, and as well sanctioned by the government. And then one that I add is you have benefited. And how did you benefit? Because when slavery was in place, you had a workforce that never got insurance, never got sick time, uh, never got workman's compensation, never got a salary, never got a 401k. And that means you had no overhead. You created an economic firestorm uh, on the basis of cotton. And cotton became the basis of the wealth of America that created the Wall Street Bank uh, and also created the uh, international wealth in Europe. The slave trade supplemented or supplanted, excuse me, spices and gold. They threw that away. That, wasn't, that, that had no value. And they began to trade in our blood, our lives. And so Republicans who uh, have always uh, been institutionalists, uh, who believe in the idea of fairness, who ad adhere to and admire Abraham Lincoln as one of their greatest presidents, uh, who actually made an economic decision and a unifying decision to unify the union uh, and, and begin to spread the wealth. Frankly, they began to look to manufacturing because the South was where the wealth was and the Union and the uh, North and the East were had to go hat in hand for the dollars that were being made by slavery. So there is no excuse for this not to be a multicultural, uh, uh, a bipartisan, multi-party uh, support 
because if you believe in the institutions of due process in the First Amendment, uh, excuse me, in the um, Bill of Rights, uh, in the 14th Amendment, uh, which is due process and equality, uh, and all uh, Republicans like to say that they're constitutionalists, uh, and some say federalists, uh, of course, uh, which I uh, take issue with, but the constitutionalists, there is no reason for them not to accept the fact that we are in the predicament of disparities in the African-American community in this nation today because of what was taken from us uh, and never given. And I give this last word in, to my answer. When the war ended, it is documented that General Sherman wanted to take South Carolina and East Coast coastal land, 400,000 acres. General Sherman wanted to do that and distribute it uh, to the freed slaves. They would get 40 acres and a mule. And I always have to tell various uh, cultural uh, icons uh, that use this, uh, that this was not humorous. It was not uh, it, is, it is not a metaphor. It was real that we were going to get freed slaves, 40 acres and a mule. And because the compromise was blown up, President Lincoln was assassinated. We had a horrible next president who took his place, who didn't care anything about the compromise coming together, slaves, nothing. And they blew it up in the, 19, in the 1887 compromise. And unfortunately, uh, we never got that 40 acres and mule. Just imagine collectively putting a, together 40 acres and a mule and the amount of wealth that we would have been able to pass on from family to family of the descendants of enslaved Africans. We never got it. I don't know how any Republican could in any way take issue with that unfairness because they want to hold up uh, their sense of, of respect for property and what one's property is. And then Democrats who've been very strong supporters of this, I think that's a combination well overdue, and we should pass H.R. 40, along with my friend's uh, legislation that talks about truth and reconciliation, uh, and pass it and get it signed by the President of the United States of America. Congresswoman uh, Jackson Lee, that was, I really appreciate you talking about the what's called Field Order 15. I mean, that's something that I talk to students about that I obviously write about. That was the legislation from Sherman. Uh, Assemblywoman Dr. Weber, I want to ask you, I want to push this question even farther because your bill is actually passed in California. And so I want to ask, rather than why it's important, more so I want to ask, why now? After we just witnessed the greatest voter turnout in American history, much of it attributable to voter turnout about race and racism in America, but the 2020 election continues to leave our country deeply polarized. How do you think your bill will be able to contribute to addressing these divides in America, healing America's original sin, and also how were you able to garner bipartisan support in the California Assembly? Well, <clears throat> I think the thing that's most important and, 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 and all of the things that have been said are, are so true and so correct, um, that this country itself will never heal until it has really fully addressed the issue and the damage done to African-Americans. And, um, and so when we begin to look at it and, and see what is happening in California, and this is a truly divided nation, there's no question about it. And simply because it is divided doesn't mean we should stop what we're doing in order to bring peace. Uh, I'm often told by someone that says, you know, well, if you bring up this issue, it's gonna divide this country. This country is already divided, that's number one. Uh, and, and us sacrificing or feeling more that we needed to, um, uh, to help the conscience of those who have offended us more than dealing with the folks who've been insulting, but because once again, it takes black life and makes it second to everybody else's life. And, and yes, we just saw a great turnout for election and clearly black people basically determine the outcome of this election and everyone acknowledges that. But there has to be more than just that. There has to be an effort to really look at the suffering that we've had and how do you correct that? We every day spend our lives trying to correct our, uh, what is happening in this country to African-Americans without the support of the government finally saying it needs to do something. To the absence of reparation, the absence of reparation is really a statement about how people do not value black life. And that is important because I said, it's you know, we talk about needing reparations, but the argument of 
a discussion of why have you never felt that you needed to give us reparations speaks about the ongoing discussion of second class citizenship that even the discussion of Abraham Lincoln when he freed the quote freed the slaves he made really clear in the Lincoln Douglas debate that he did not believe in equality for us and that he he preferred that the superior position in America be assigned to the white race and, and that was his position, that was the position that was going to follow, that was the position that eventually became a part of the whole um, uh, policy with regards to uh, freedom and what kind of freedom we didn't have, and eventually working its way to the Plessy versus Ferguson decision. So we have, uh, we, we have to ask this question and we have to answer this question, and reparations should bring that forward because it was not a passive thing that occurred to us. It's not that people just all of a sudden signed a bill, we all were free and life ended with that in terms of people moving forward. There was outright effort, direct actions to limit the influence of African-Americans, whether it was in voting, whether it was in economic development, whether it was where people lived, we were not left alone. I mean, we were constantly uh, discriminated against from that point forward and even to this day. So, you know, it's no accident that all of our folks, that we have such large numbers of us in prison, that we have a prison system that is biased against us. Uh, it's, no, it's, no, it's no accident that a Floyd's death occurred in a public situation where people watched it and had no sense of remorse regarding it because it, re it reeked of all the lynchings that occurred in this country in the early part of the, the century where lynching was like a social event. Books were uh, written about it. People took pictures and made posters and sent to relatives. That's something that has to be addressed in this discussion of why have we never felt that we owed African-Americans anything? And it still gets back to the second class citizenship position. So as we look at it, I, I, I recently was looking at the fact that when Obama was in office, I think whether well, it was 50 million or some number that was given to some Jews in New York who were poor because people felt these people should not be poor given all the, the things that exist in this country. And as a result, we're given reparations years after uh, um, the, the Holocaust had ended. But most importantly, the United States didn't create the Holocaust. We were not the ones who had done some grieve, uh, some grievous act against the Jews in this country. Yet we felt a sense of responsibility to talk about reparations for them out of our own coffers. No one has seemed to bring that issue forward other than us in the most recent years. And, and it, so it becomes important that when we start talking about reparations and, and why we need it, we also have to deal with the issue of why have we not felt as a nation that we needed to do it. And that gets into the whole issue of reconciliation and truth and those kinds of things. And we have these eruptions every four or five years that exist in our community because we have never dealt honestly with the damage that the average citizen has done and continues to do and enjoy the benefits of having enslaved us. Even our friends and our colleagues who have benefited, who have intergenerational wealth that we have never had and, and, and basically uh, continue to, uh, don't recognize the fact that that is built on the bodies of slaves and the debt and the graves of Africans in this country uh, as a result of that. And they have the benefit of having intergenerational wealth. They may not be enslaving people today, they say, but you still have benefited from it. You have built your kingdom on our bodies and our backs and, and no one has said we need to have reparations. So it is important that those for the bipartisan support that it exists. We've been able to get even some friends, uh, one Republican who lives way, who's in district one way up north, voted for reparations and has been sending me materials about black people living in California, the various conventions that occurred, to talk about the grievous activities that occurred, the Underground Railroad that was in California. And so we in California have to deal with it because we constantly look across the, the nation and say, oh, Mississippi, Alabama, oh my goodness. But we have not dealt with the fact that why is it that black folks in, in California are poor and very poor, why we have limited number of businesses and why our educational system is so geared against our children and California black kids suffer more than anyone else. So we have to ask those questions and we have to get an answer and we have to find remedy for it. Professor Weber, you better preach. Look, you, you said a couple of quotes that was so profound. You said, why are we worried about helping the conscience of people that's who right. have offended us. I think that's a pattern that we see often. And then you said, 
people's views of reparations speaks to how they value black life. Whether that be about what Congresswoman Barbara Lee was, uh, or Sheila Jackson Lee was saying about black people mm -hmm. being the only group that did not receive reparations. And then also you mentioned the Holocaust, which there is a precedent there in the sense that spouses and relatives of people who were victims of the Holocaust are now receiving those reparations, which is right in line with how we think about what's happening in the United States and what you all are pushing. Uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, I wanna ask you and then go to the others. Why is it important to think about restitution as finances as well as truth and healing? So beyond mandating, what does this legislation look like at the federal, state and local levels? And here, as it relates to uh, healing, as it relates to truth, I'm thinking about everything from what students learn in school to the way that banks operate to businesses and housing. Why is it important to think about restitution in a holistic way um, that expands how we might think about healing in the United States? You, you know, uh, there have been over 40 countries which after horrific genocides, crimes against humanity, slavery, have established commissions, uh, various types of commissions, but they all in, entailed a truth-telling session where descendants of those, those atrocities come forward, whether current or not. They come forward to talk about the impact of those atrocities. The United States has never had one. Actually, Belgium is about to establish one uh, as a result of our Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, so this truth telling moment has never happened in America. And so we've never had public understanding or support except white supremacists understand it. But we've never had the majority of the country really recognize that what systemic racism really is as manifested by what Congresswoman Jackson Lee laid out and what Assembly Member Dr. Weber laid out. When you see, and I had, let me tell you, after uh, Mr. Joyd's murder, Mr. Floyd's murder, my constituents, many, very enlightened white people called me and said, what are we seeing here? Why is this going on? Then they would call and say, why do we see so many black people dying of COVID? I mean, it was like struggling with no understanding. And I don't have to say, this is 401 years uh, ago when uh, the first enslaved Africans were brought to America. And this is a manifestation of never really addressing systemic racism and the impact of slavery. And so we have to have this moment in this country where people uh, are able to, to and, and we call, my, my bill is called um, Truth, Racial Healing, Transformation, because we believe there's nothing really to reconcile in America. You have to have something to reconcile as much of nothing as it relates to African Americans. And so transformation means repairing the damage, means reparations, uh, because systemic racism, and we hear, and I'm glad to hear uh, President Lake Biden talk about it dealing with systemic racism. I'm glad to hear those who last year wouldn't even utter the word systemic racism. Now they're talking about it, but they don't know what's next. They don't know what it means. They don't know what it means in terms of the only thing way you can deal with systemic racism is repairing the damage, which is reparations. That's the only way. <laughs> and so we have to uh, educate the public around this and and recognize that those who don't support it aren't going to support they they have white supremacy and racial injustice in their dna and they're not going to do it anyway and just move forward but i believe like uh, uh dr weber did in california that that we can educate the public and and they there's no option i mean i've talked to my constituents who, who asked me why they were seeing this <laughs> and they're very progressive people <laughs> and i had to educate them i had to tell them as oh yeah, what can we do to get HR 40 passed, right? And so we brought on more people just through this process because of the ignorance and because schools don't teach this and because people uh, in, in California where, where we're what, 6% of the population uh, have, have dismissed so many of the struggles of African-Americans here in California. And Dr. Weber mentioned the poverty rates. Childhood poverty rates in California in my district are comparable to childhood poverty rates in Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. Uh, average income 
income, uh, the average, uh, the wealth gap, the uh, mass incarceration, disproportionate rates as it relates to African Americans, everything in California is, is consistent with the status of African Americans throughout the country. And so there's no answer to how do we deal with systemic racism, okay, unless you just tinker around the edges and, and make some mo modest reforms here, modest reforms there. You, we have to crack this finally, this chain mm -hmm. uh, of the, the chains of slavery. And that's what uh, we've got to do and move forward on that. And those that aren't going to join us, we leave them behind. The rest of the country, I think, just as they did in California, will come around. Mm, powerful. And as we unfortunately get ready to run out of time, I want to ask Congresswoman uh, Barbara Lee or Congresswoman, uh, Congresswoman Jackson Lee, and then I'll come back to Congresswoman Barbara Lee at the end. I want to ask you and also Dr. Weber for final comments on why this issue needs to happen now. Why potentially some of it is happening in 2020 and then it's also happening in 2021, hopefully to have this legislation passed um, at the federal level. So Congresswoman Jackson Lee. Well, there's another question that I want to jump in uh, with uh, uh, great vigor uh, and uh, acknowledge uh, uh, Congresswoman Lee and Dr. Weber for their uh, enormous planting of the seeds, uh, which I want to just nourish and grow. I, I want to emphasize to all of your viewers uh, that there were 4,000 and some uncounted lynchings, uh, and they were public activity. They were social Sunday afternoon picnic activities, and they were black, black men. And, and throughout the 20th century, isn't that amazing? In the last century, we were lynching individuals. We only recently got an anti-lynching law passed in the House uh, uh, sponsored by Congressman Rush uh, when we added it to the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act in 2020. Uh, but all throughout the 20, 20th century, we suffered the indignities of, uh, of slavery. Uh, black soldiers who came home from World War II uh, feeling empowered, one of the bloodiest wars were redlined and they couldn't, as Barbara's father, walk into communities, wear their uniform and get any kind of house, they were redlined. That was in the 1940s and the 1950s. Uh, and so here we are today in 2020, and let me just uh, share with you uh, very quickly, black infants are more likely, more than twice as likely to die as white infants. Um, a high school graduate white American and a high school graduate black American, the white American has 10 times more wealth. Uh, the black American is disproportionately denied mortgages and fair uh, lending rates. Uh, black women are higher numbers of them to die in pregnancy. Uh, and as well, we know that we are more likely to be incarcerated. Black students are disproportionately punished and criminalized in their schools. Now, does that just happen out of the air? It is the continuing resistance to accepting white racism and institutionalized racism. When I asked uh, General Barr, Attorney General Barr, representing, of course, this administration, the same administration that said in Charlottesville, Virginia, there are good people on both sides and white Nazis were walking around with American white Nazis walking around with torches on uh, my alma mater, the University of Virginia Law School. Um, uh, but what was most heinous is to, in the light of a young woman's death, uh, the commander in chief saying that there was uh, good people on both sides. And when the attorney general, the chief law enforcement officer of the nation that is supposed to protect our rights was asked the question in judiciary committee, is there white racism, institutionalized racism? There was a numbing answer uh, that could not be discerned. And basically, I don't think so. And so if there's ever a time for uh, the truth, the rec the the um, understanding of uh, this issue of slavery um, and uh, HR H Res 100, and then HR 40, it is now, and we have captured in honoring our ancestors, that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who wrote a book in the 50s, I believe, that said why we can't wait. That is our mantra. That is our theme. Why we can't wait, and all the numbers that I've given you are the glaring example of why we cannot wait any longer. There is an impossibility of waiting any longer. And again, we don't come 
in anger. We don't come with violence. We adhere to the nonviolent protest, which generated the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which reflects and responds to the tragedy of Breonna Taylor, the heinous acts of uh, Mr. Brooks in Atlanta, Tamir Rice, uh, Pamela Turner, Sandra Bland, Eric Garner, uh, Jacob Blake, uh, and Elijah in Colorado, and others unnamed, and all those in California. And so we can't wait. And Mayor Garcetti of Los Angeles says we can't wait. Danny Glover says we can't wait. John Legend says we can't wait. The NAACP says we can't wait. The Urban League says we can't wait. Wait, Presbyterians, uh, Episcopalians, and 200 religious, civil rights, moderate, conservative, uh, and others uh, uh, supporting this legislation. Finally, let me say uh, that um, the U.S. Conference of Mayors who have to provide over cities that have a crumbling infrastructure. Uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors is combined with mayors from all backgrounds, small cities, large cities, they, in their last conference, unilaterally and unilaterally and enthusiastically endorsed HR 40. And they were so bold as to go ahead and put a number on it. And so if you want to stop African-American students from being less likely than white students to access college-ready courses, eat, uh, to have black students have less access to honors and advanced placement courses, stop African-American students from having schools located with less qualified teachers, stop the systematic bias of uh, in teacher expectations of African-American students, uh, and of course, having black students spend less time in the classroom due to discipline, overall not educating our children, which are our wealth, that's our wealth. If you want that to stop, if you want the babies that are being born now that are black, if you want the preschoolers and the primary and secondary schoolers to be able to be respected in their classrooms and to have equality, then you want to work with Congresswoman Barbara Lee and Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, uh, building on Dr. Weber's enormous work in California and pass HR 40, the Commission is Studying Developed Reparations uh, now, uh, and of course, HRS 100 to bring us truth and understanding. If you don't want to go back, if you don't want to see the hanging fruit, uh, and if you don't want to be redlined in 2020 or jailed in 2020, or at the hands of misconduct of those who have not accepted white racism and lose your life. Because we know, as Barbara said, they're good officers and good law enforcement and good people in Congress and good people teaching, good people all around. If you don't want that to continue, and for America to stand up and own up to the government sanctioned acts of slavery, then you want to pass HR 40, Republican or Democrat, no matter what your cultural history is, history is you want to pass HR 40 and HRS 100. Yes, indeed. Congresswoman Jackson Lee, thank you. Dr. Weber. Yes, I, 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 um, I appreciate all the, what the, my Congress, uh, women have stated and and they really appreciate their their depth of history and 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 understanding you know when i was a student at ucla there was a philosophy professor who had a test his final exam was one word and it was why the answer is why not you know why now why not uh, we have suffered in this country for over 400 years and we have uh, done everything that one could imagine that would demonstrate to this nation that we are responsible, that we are loyal, that we are committed, that we are fair players, that we're contributors and everything else. And nothing has seemed to move the needle significantly enough to basically have them respect our lives and who we are uh, in this country. You know, the, the death of Floyd, as well as there's so many that have happened before and continue to this day, despite that, uh, clearly emphasizes the depth and the deep hatred that exists in this country toward African-Americans more than any other group. And we have to understand that. We have to root out that, that, that understanding of that, because if not, we continue to, to kind of smooth it over with something cute periodically. People get excited. They get concerned. They do one or two minor things, and then it rolls on. And we find ourselves in the same position again, uh, confronting the racism, the institutional things that are against us. We have to basically break that system. And, and most folks know that's generally what I do. I mean, I, I don't have all these other aspirations that people talk about. 
I'm dealing with the system that I have to deal with now. You know, we just passed 1460, AB 1460. That is the ethnic studies bill. Nobody thought it would ever pass because why? The rules of the game did not allow us to introduce the fact that every student at the Cal State University system has to take one ethnic studies course at least. And those ethnic studies courses are defined in those four ethnic groups. And so people thought it would never happen. We got it through both houses. We've been working on it for years in terms of making our members recognize the value of knowing their history and the impact on those, not only on the kids who, who were studying, but more important upon the state. And it was not going, and it got to the governor's desk. And uh, the rules of the game was that you don't do that. You let the board of trustees do the curriculum and you do something else. But we had tried for seven years and that system is broken. And I said to the governor, if you're going to fight institutional racism, this is it. You got to break it. You don't dibby dabby around it. You got to confront it and you got to break it. Which shocked everybody when he signed the bill. And now a half a million students at the Cal State University system, the largest public system in the world, will require every student to take a course in ethnic studies to begin this process of learning about us. And it's not gonna happen because other people think they should, it happened. You're gonna have to fight the system and you gotta break the system because the system has to be responsive because right now the system continues to roll on and it continues to do the things that we think uh, that, that su supports the system. But you can't constantly support something that is forever destroying you and others around you. So it, it, the question is why not? Why don't we do this? Well, we have more now elected officials, black elected officials than we've ever had before in Congress. We have more uh, in, in, in California. We've got folks who are focused across the nation. If we don't do it, who will? Who will? And who will bring in the kind of resources and education that is so essential? So for me, you know, the question is not why not? Why haven't we done it before? And, that, and, and, we, and, we, and mainly because we wanted to make sure that we weren't offending everybody, you know. Uh, and, and, and my congressman uh, at, at the time, years ago, I was having, I had a radio program. He said, Shirley, if you introduce reparations, he said, you know, a white, it, will, it will make white people really mad. I said, are you, are you concerned that I'm also mad? Why do I have to spend my whole life worrying about you being mad about giving me justice? When I have to worry about that, that makes me a second class citizen because your feelings and your sense of wealth and worth is greater than mine. And that should never exist. I'm the one who's been aggrieved and therefore I should be the one that you're most concerned about because the others haven't been hurt at all. And so we have to we have to recognize that we have a standing in this country. We have a place to be and there's no better time than now that our children, our grandchildren, and, and generations to come should not have to ask the question, what is my worth? Why wasn't I ever given an opportunity to be successful? And why is it that every effort my, my people made to bring me forward, to give me an opportunity, to give me something was warded by the system, destroyed by the system? Why? To support a system that doesn't support me. And so it's critical. So I, you know, when people ask me, why are you doing this? I said, why not? Tell me why I shouldn't. Well, you might hurt other people's feelings. Well, do you care that I have feelings also? You know, you might have to share the wealth. Are you concerned that I have nothing and you have everything? I mean, how fair can the world be? And so I, you know, I take this as, as, as like, that you can't tell me why I can't. So why should I tell you why I should? Because it's fair, it's just, it's right. And we will not move forward as a nation so long as we have this generation of African-Americans that are so aggrieved. We can work hard as we want to keep them out of prison, but if we don't give them something to stay out of prison for, education, opportunities, businesses, great jobs, those kind of things, that gives them a sense that they're, if they put their energy in, they will get what they get out. And that's not what they feel right now. And so as a result, we are still battling those, those issues that are there. A few of us make it out, but the vast majority do not. And so we have to basically do this. This is really the soul of the nation. I don't know if people talk about all these other things. This is the soul of the nation. When you look at the anger that was directed toward black people in this last administration and was still directed toward us more than any other group, we are the soul of the nation. This is the question that this nation has to answer and has to answer quickly if we're going to ever find the kind of peace and ever work toward that more perfect union. It is by making us whole 
as Africans who which were stolen from this country. I told one of my friends who wanted to me to include reparations with the Indians and everybody else. I said, listen, I know you folks have been aggrieved and, I, and I'm not gonna argue who's the most offended and who's the most aggrieved in this nation. We can get into that discussion. I said, but let me tell you something. I generally don't get into it out of respect for others, but if I did, I would win. That's the reality. If I debated the issue of who's been the worst treated in this country, I would win. Period. Thank you. No, Dr. Weber, your comments highlight so many things. I mean, first, what we just seen last week is that black people continue to save the democracy. And not only that, what this conversation is emblematic of is that when black women lead, we all win. But the question that I always have is who is protecting black women from the cuts in the glass ceilings that they shattered. And that's how I think about you. That's how I think about Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. That's how I think about Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Thank you all for leading. And what I wanna do is thank the audience. I wanna thank the organizers of this event. This has been great. And I wanna turn it over to Congresswoman Barbara Lee for final remarks. Sure, Dr. Ray, first, let me thank you so much for uh for keeping this conversation going, not only as a moderator, but because of your depth of understanding of these, this issue, because it is just uh, critical uh, to talk about this, but to move forward and build support for the commission in California led by Dr. Weber and her bold leadership. And, and Dr. Weber, I'm so glad that you laid it out there so clearly in terms of why not, because this is, the only option to make our country whole, which means African-Americans must have reparations to repair the damage of the past. And, and you laid out, as, as well as Congresswoman Jackson Lee, the whole notion of systemic racism. Slavery was built as an institution. It was a lawful institution in this country. It was not unlawful. It was a system of government. And so this system has got to be uh, dismantled. And that's what cracking these chains of slavery mean today. And so the only option is for us to move forward. We hear and we know people talk about structural change, systemic change, systemic racism. But quite frankly, I don't think they know and recognize that that means reparations. And so we have a lot of educating to do, but we're going to do that. And uh, I think our young people who are with us with the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center, they get it. They understand what systemic racism is. They understand what happened 401 years ago in terms of the Middle Passage. They understand why they're why the poverty rates are disproportionately African-American and, and mass incarceration and, and health care and the wealth gap uh, and the unequal education. Our young people really understand that. They know that it has not worked. It has not worked for them. And so I just want to salute uh, Karen and Roy and uh, the Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Freedom Center, our supporters. Uh, of course, um, Elihu Harris, uh, my friend and partner with these lecture series, who's still, even in his retired days, still on the front, the, the battlefront, uh, fighting for African Americans for this uh, session today. Because it's timely. Uh, we have to capture the moment. We have to seize the time, as Bobby Seale always said. And we have to do that now because we cannot wait. Uh, Dr. Weber has fought in California to get us this far. So it's now time for our national government and our new administration and the Congress to follow California's lead and pass HR 40 and HR 100. So thank you all again so much for giving us the space and the opportunity to be with you.